So I want to welcome everybody. My name is Ben Mangan. I'm the executive director of the Center for Social Sector Leadership. I'm also on the faculty here. I am very delighted to see all of you here at our information session for the Berkeley Board Fellows Program. Um, I'm going to say a few words about the center. Um, to say a few words about the Board Fellows Program, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Mark Westover, our Associate Director at the Center, who's going to go through some of the nuts and bolts. And then we're very fortunate to be able to hear from Joe and Juliana, who served as Board Fellows. We're just going to have a very conversational Q&A, and we're going to take some questions from the audience as soon as we get through a couple of the basics, and um, try to wrap up as close to 1.30 as we possibly can. So our center is one of um, three centers that are focused on social impact. We all live under the umbrella of the Institute for Business and Social Impact, and we all address social impact in different ways. So for Sizzle, that's what we call our center, um, we tend to focus on organizations that work across sectors, cross-sector network leadership, all for the sake of, of serving problems that are often either unsolved or solved very badly by the market or just by public policy alone. And that is often social ventures and social enterprises and often nonprofit organizations, which constitute 10% um, of American wages and 5% of American GDP. Those are like shockingly big numbers when you get into it. Um, and we do this in a number of different ways. We have programs like this for students. The other sort of marquee student program we have is Social Sector Solutions, which you will be hearing about as well, which we do with McKinsey. We also do some research. Our founder, Nora Silver, um, and another member of our faculty, Paul Jansen, did some really groundbreaking research on multi-sector leadership. We have some more applied research going on now with the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation on how to be more effective um, in using philanthropy, how do you, sorry, how to be more effective in taking risk, taking more good risk using philanthropy to solve social problems. And we also are growing our student advisory board. So one of the things that I wanted to encourage you to do if you're interested in this is to apply. We're gonna take six to eight new student advisory board members. We'll be in touch with folks via email. We're just gonna actually reach out to everybody who has come to any of our events. We'll also post this on the Social Impact at Haas Facebook page. And we'll open the application on September 18th. And then um, it'll close on September 27th and we'll let folks know uh, not too long after that. And the advisory board, we're really excited about this year because it'll give us a chance to have a, a good sized group of students that just give us feedback on how we and other centers can do a better job in serving you, in preparing you to be social impact leaders, to help connect us to the students given how many offerings there are, um, to have even better networking. You get to meet our um, advisory board members that are the non-student advisors, many of whom are alums and leaders in social impact. Excuse me. Um, and also to um, work on specific projects. So the project on the J.P. Morgan Chase Risk and Philanthropy is one example. There's another project that we'll probably ask some of the advisors to work on related to the startup ecosystem um, and social impact innovation. So please apply if you're interested. We'd really appreciate it and look forward to having a more robust student advisory board and our offerings will benefit as a result of that. But back to board fellows. So when you think about the fact that nonprofit organizations are typically the organizations that sort of step into the breach. They solve the hardest problems in society that go unsolved by the market and as I said earlier, are either unsolved or badly solved by public policy, always with less resources. And for a sector to be 10% of American wages and 5% of American GDP, the governance of it is really remarkable. So all of these organizations that make up such a significant part of our economy in this country are governed by volunteers who are stewards of mission and money in communities across the country where that money is arguably the most value-laden money in society because people donate it and get to choose which cause it supports and avoid taxes, or it is fueled by government contracts which come from taxes and are decided by governments to solve problems that matter. And you as a board fellow have an opportunity to learn what it's like to actually be in the room where you're making decisions about how our most value-laden dollars in society solving our toughest problems get used in an unbelievably complex and challenging environment. And this puts you on the front lines as a board fellow, working with board members and executives from a nonprofit organization, 
learning how they function, learning about nonprofit governance, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it, which we'll get into on our panel. Um, and it's a really incredible experience if you want to think about where to strategically locate yourself to have the greatest amount of leverage um, here in a, as, as a board fellow in your experience and also in the future for you as you grow as a leader. Um, one of the things that we learned in our multi-sector leadership research is that um, very successful leaders across all sectors cited board leadership as something that was really, really important to their development as a leader and their ability to actually work across sectors to solve problems and advance their career. So there's the part that's very altruistic and then there's also the part that's, that's real about the degree to which this actually helps you in your career. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark who's gonna go through the details of the program a little bit and then we'll, our, we'll get to our panel. All right. I'm mic'd up. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Hello, everybody. So just want to take you through the program, um, how it works, what to expect uh, as it runs from October through April of the school year, uh, and how to apply. Okay. So what is Berkeley Board Fellows? Uh, we match students with local nonprofits. This year, uh, we have 37 nonprofits who are looking for a board match. Um, we don't... We Unfortunately, uh, can't always match uh, for every nonprofit, uh, but we have a very uh, uh, good algorithm and matching process uh, where we can match as, as, as many as, as possible. Uh, so really, really high quality um, list. If you have uh, and are curious to see it, there's a link on the uh, Sizzle website, which is uh, haas.berkeley.edu slash CSSL. Uh, and if you go that and, and you click on uh, go to that site and click on Berkeley Board Fellows, you'll be able to find the list of those nonprofits. You could also uh, follow the um, slightly long bitly uh, on the bottom of these pages that should hopefully bring you to the, the same place. Um, as Ben said, this is to grow your grow your leadership and foster your impact. Uh, we you know kind of have two stu students tend to have two goals in mind uh, when they join. Uh, either they kind of come from the nonprofit sector and kind of want to see a different layer and a different participation at the board level. Uh, or we have uh, students who may not immediately be going into a social impact career, but do know at some point in, in their life, they probably will uh, you know, play a role in making a larger social impact and want exposure uh, and, and take advantage of the chance to learn now. So those are kind of the two uh, motivations. Uh, as I said, it runs October through April uh, through the year. Uh, and you are onboarded and serve as an observer and non-voting member. So uh, you get to observe and get to um, you know, participate in view, uh, but you don't get to vote uh, as that. So just so you understand the status of, of participating on the board. Okay? So what do we require of you? Uh, it's, I think, pretty straightforward. Attend board and committee meetings. Uh, so most of the boards we have, one of the prerequisites for them to be uh, and qualify for our program, for the nonprofits themselves, is they have to have at least six board meetings a year. Um, and we've screened these nonprofits to make sure that they're both of sufficient size and scale where you can have a, a great insight and a great experience. We found in the past, unfortunately, that if it's too small, you don't, it's, um, you don't quite get the sense of what a real board experience is, is like. And, and uh, so, so we modify uh, for that. Uh, we, there's a give back. So uh, as kind of, as sort of, they give you the gift of serving on their board as, as an uh, observer and member, uh, there's a small project uh, at the end that you give back to them as kind of a, a thank you uh, and whatnot. You'll be, each uh, nonprofit has two people that serve on the board. So there's a two, two uh, applicants to one nonprofit. So you, you will be delivering this uh, when working with a, a colleague and we do, as we, do our, as we do the matching, we do try to match as best we can. So for instance, evening and weekend MBA students, uh, we try to match them together because they have similar schedules. Full-time MBAs, we try to match, they have similar schedules. We have other, um, and, and we welcome participants from other grad schools. So whether it's Masters of Development Practice, Masters of Public Policy, Masters of Public Health, uh, Law, et cetera. Uh, we try to match uh, you as well, just uh, in the hopes that you'll have a similar schedule and be able to make this work. Um, I'll cover what the projects look like in more detail uh, in, in another slide. As far as participating in our program, uh, there's the kickoff, which we will hold, hold on uh, October 10th. 
Uh, there's scope refinement, which we do generally in October, soon after uh, kickoff, to make sure that uh, we want uh, to make sure that the project that the nonprofit is designing and uh, asking for is also achievable by students uh, uh, and typically will be achievable by you in the, in the second semester. And as first years, you probably don't know what, you haven't experienced a second semester, but it's a very busy time. You know, you'll be looking for your summer internship, you'll be trying new courses, et cetera. So we wanna make sure that we don't scale the projects too big uh, and take up all your time. That's not fair to you. Uh, and that, you know, it could potentially d lead to disaster. So we try to keep it much, much smaller and constrained. Uh, so we m manage the scope uh, in October. We'll check in periodically with you to make sure that uh, the projects are going well. Uh, and typically they go uh, pretty smoothly. Every so often, you know, there, we have to have some conversations with the nonprofit to say, hey, this is probably what's more realistic. Or conversely, we might have a conversation with you to make sure that you're showing up and participating, et cetera. Your commitment to this program and your commitment uh, to this journey is really paramount to its success. Uh, and then we have a, a finale where we gather you uh, in April and have you actually share lessons with one another of what you've learned uh, from serving on the board. Uh, and I think hopefully, and we'll hear from uh, Joe and Juliana, hopefully that that's a, a valuable uh, experience, so, okay. So projects can fall in, in, typically fall into four buckets. So marketing, finance, strategy, and performance. Uh, we try to keep things you know, limited in scope. Uh, so like brand audits, market research, and kind of the marketing side, something that you, a quick analysis that someone could do. Uh, finance, like for instance, an analysis of an under, underperforming program for that nonprofit, uh, or kind of a, a, a create a financial model to determine how much that nonprofit should raise. That's uh, often, uh, questions nonprofits have and, and would love your expertise to, to help them with uh, strategy. So ma many people or many nonprofits uh, want to know how to have a social media presence. How do we project ourselves and how do we you know, get more involved in the community through social media? Uh, and then lastly, just kind of general performance. So kind of teaching management and board design thinking, uh, program evaluation, feasibility, et cetera. So, Matching, how it's done. Uh, you know, I realize probably on these slides, I'm not sure, uh, the applications are due September 17th. So for the 12th now, uh, you know, these are due shortly. Um, so when you do your application, and hopefully, uh, hopefully many of you will, uh, be thoughtful and complete. And what we ask is that you state your preferences. The, the art of matching is for you to match to something that matches your passion with something that you can commit and deliver to. Um, so as you look and, and kind of fill out the application, be thoughtful uh, towards that and, and have a little bit of self-examination, self-reflection to say, is this really what I, what I can uh, commit to? Is this putting the best me forward uh, as a board fellow? Um, we have a matching committee. So as part of our matching process, we, we try to find people from each cohort uh, to be representative who will know other people in the cohort and might uh, be able, it, we find it facilitates uh, the process for those who um, don't match immediately. Um, and we ask that you uh, consider joining. We also need uh, folks um, from programs that aren't MBA. Uh, we need MDPs, MPPs, MPHs, just so we can have those communities represented and represented well uh, as best we can. So you'll see in the application, it's just a checkbox um, you know, for you to fill out. So if, if you wanna be on the matching committee, uh, please do. Uh, we'll, we'll match here in this room the morning. I'm gonna look at Stephanie, fr uh, Friday, September 20th. So uh, it's a good process. Uh, logistics is something to take in mind. I'm not sure, how, um, and, and this may be in a world of, of readily accessible Uber, scooters, et cetera, and multimodal transportation. This is less of an issue, but it, it, um, some of these nonprofits do very far and wide. So for instance, I think one of our furthest flung uh, nonprofits is called Sweetwater. It's in, actually in Northern Marin. So uh, I don't know how many of you are, have had a chance to explore the area, but Northern Marin is about an hour car ride away. So, um, you know, take that into consideration uh, if that's, you know, for some of you who might be living in Marin and commuting here, this is a benefit. For those of you who are here or maybe living in Oakland, this is a, potentially a long commute. Um, most of, uh, we do uh, ask the nonprofits kind of how close they are to BART 
and we do feature their addresses so that um, kind of plays into the, the thinking and matching. And we ask you as well kind of how transportation constrained you are um, to get to an arm um, uh, place. It's us, yeah. It comes out, or I just, it's not us, it's, it's you, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I joined you momentarily there, but yeah, uh, it, it's on your own dime, and, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but do, do take logistics into consideration uh, as you kind of, as you state your preferences for the nonprofits that you wish to join, okay? And then again, we try to pair you by program, so we try to put you in, uh, as, as much as we can with somebody with a similar schedule, usually uh, by program if we can. All right. This is uh, just a visual of the uh, a timeline of the program year. So we run through 2019. So Oct October 10th, again, is the kickoff and client introductions. will be in speaker forum. Uh, scope development um, uh, for kind of the, the next couple of weeks. And then uh, on October 25th, we'll have kind of, we'll, we'll ask you to send the scopes to the center uh, and or your mentor to make sure that, that we align. Uh, then we'll check in, uh, typically kind of the, the, first, the last week of January, one of the first weeks you'll be back uh, from winter break. Uh, and then again, the program finale uh, is, in, is in April. And the final projects typically are delivered around April. Um, you know, life being what it is, it's complex. Some, some do uh, fall over and, and get delivered into May. But hopefully that's, uh, an open and uh, an open discussion with the nonprofit and is kind of understood on, on on all parties involved. So that's what we typically aim for schedule. Okay, so that's what it that is our process. Uh, we again encourage you uh, to do so. You can apply today by following the Bitly to our bo our board fellows information. Uh, the students link has again is is designed for you. Uh, the deadline is September seventeenth. Uh, so um, please apply by the deadline. If you have questions and need to reach us, uh, just email us at socialimpact.haas.berkeley.edu. That comes to Stephanie and me, uh, and we'll do our best to answer your questions in a, in a timely manner. So let me pause. Sure. That's a great question. Uh, you're welcome to do it in your second year as well. So, and we typically have, it's maybe two thirds, kind of three quarters first year to kind of a quarter, a third, second year. Yeah, sorry? Um, they apply less. A, a lot of people actually want to, they, they get here and they want to apply and, and get going right away, so. Good question. Yes? We have a list, but it does take a, a bit of work to refine that, uh, and, and we just haven't refined the list uh, at this point. But we do for the individual nonprofits with their particular, um, some of the ideas they have in mind. And then some actually have like kind of project A, B, or C, so, but yeah. Uh, that's a great question. Typically not, uh, but there are several examples of people who uh, have stayed on. Um, so it's really kind of the chemistry of you and that nonprofit and kind of that fit there. Um, it, it, there's no, nothing to forbid it from happening for sure, uh, and it does happen uh, on occasion. But it's not expected that you would stay on. So. All right. Let's oh. get some student voices if we can, because I want to, are they burning quick questions? Uh, typically, uh, we take about uh, 50 to 60. Really, it, it's kind of a, kind of a, a demonstrated uh, passion and skill set for that, not skill set, just kind of passion and commitment uh, for that nonprofit. So, um, and, and that nonprofit area. So. For instance, past work in some kind of the similar subject area or other uh, uh, individual reasons for you to choose uh, the certain priorities, like it kind of falls back into the be thoughtful. Like to the extent that we can understand you and your motivation and why you want to do this, that really helps your application. Uh,
Joe right. and Juliana. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Thank you. Joe and Juliana were board fellows, right? And um, this is the time where we get to just be very real about what the experience is like is in, a, in, a, in an environment where resources are constrained and you're solving hard problems, um, there can be some serious challenges. And I guess that w one thing that I would just like to start with is just for you to just introduce yourselves and then talk about the organization that you were a board fellow for. Um, and then maybe say a, a little bit about what was most rewarding what was most challenging, and what was most surprising? I'm gonna let you go first. <laughs> There's a lot of questions at once. Um, I'm Juliana, I am a second year student in the Haas MBA program. Uh, the Berkeley Board Fellow projects that I worked on was for Superstars Literacy. It's a nonprofit in Oakland that focuses on literacy intervention for students in like K through second grade. Um, I, I, about six elementary schools. And what they did was they'd hire AmeriCorps fellows that would go into the classroom to do intervention work during the day and then uh, work as after school kind of like teachers. And one of the things, the challenges that they were faced with is they really had difficulty getting to expand their pipeline. Um, as many of you, if you've worked in nonprofits know, when the economy is stronger, it's a lot harder to recruit people into like nonprofit roles and teaching roles and things like that. So they wanted us to think through some like different pipelines they could tackle. Um, the other sub projects that they want us to potentially think about that they brought to the table initially were like uh, looking through their budget to see if there was anything that they could like adapt or cut, and then also um, just helping them try to like source more more applicants. Um, the most rewarding part of the program, I think, would be when we did a full audit of their. Um, application process for AmeriCorps fellows and really helped them figure out how they could trim down some of the extra steps they were inserting into the process since they just had one full-time staff member that could work on it. And then what the most challenging, yeah. um, we did at one point get like this panicked email about an emergency board meeting because they thought that they were gonna have to declare bankruptcy and they were not gonna be able to like cover the financing for the year. And um, that was actually a great lesson in just like the politics of being on a board because more or less they called this meeting to uh, really encourage the board members that hadn't yet like paid in to contribute to the organization to like put their money where their mouth was. Um, and then the most surprising was the last one? Was it? Okay. Um, that was a fairly surprising moment, um, but I think m more or less just uh, how, how big of a challenge this group of folks was committed to taking on. Um, I was shocked really that they had AmeriCorps fellows at all, given that they can't even like give them a living wage for San Francisco. So these are people that are taking on a role where you know they aren't even making minimum wage. And so like their passion just for uh, really improving the educational landscape in Oakland was inspiring. Joe, just for one second, just before I forget, um, we are recording this, and so what I'd like to do for the second part of questions, if you have a question, please step to the mic there. And if you have a question now, you could even stand up and make Joe and Juliana nervous. <laughs> Line up. Thanks for that, Ben. Um, I'm Joe. I came to Haas having done eight years in social impact in India. And so was really drawn to board fellows as a way of kind of continuing to contribute to a, to a community that I was eager to kind of become a part of. I went to Habitat for Humanity in San Francisco, which was amazing. They, I think they probably do work that all of you are aware of. I was charged with helping them identify new locations and new possibilities where they might go and develop um, housing projects that, that would be well funded, that would be well received by the local council, that would be impactful to the local people. In terms of the highlight, I think it was, it was really sitting in on the boards. Um, they're fascinating. It's incredible access. You, you, you get to meet incredible people and you get to kind of see big decisions being made and, and yeah, strategy being kind of discussed. And it just felt like a real privilege to have that kind of an access and that kind of an opportunity. I think the, the biggest challenge for me 
was going in with complete ambiguity. You're not a paid member of staff, you're a student. You're turning up with good intentions, but no real power, no real influence necessarily, or not formally recognized. You're very much appreciated and very much welcomed. They want you there. But they're typically a, a resource-strapped organization who've got 101, a million and one things to be doing already. And so I think, to me, that was the biggest challenge, was to step up and to own the project and to actually hold some people that were way more powerful than I was to account and say, actually, before I do anything else, I need this from you. And I, I need you to kind of step up and I need access from you and I need this phone number. I think that was, that was initially quite challenging as a bumbling international student trying to make their way in America. Um, the surprising thing was, was people's response to that. People want it. People want to be pushed. People know that you care. Um, people are really happy to have you there. And so I was very pleasantly surprised that when I did try and be a little bit more pointed with my communications that, that people responded back and we actually started making things happen. And that was great. Very cool. Um, why don't we dive in with a question since you're right there. Wow, That's very formal. Hello. Um, hi, I'm an MPP student, so not um, very familiar with the concept of giving free labor to do kind of social <laughs> impact projects. Um, so specifically wondering what makes the work that you, you all did, and this is actually probably a question for you all specifically, what makes that work specific to board work versus, or and serving on a board versus just doing general kind of uh, projects for organizations? Why don't I, let me answer at the high level, center level, and then I'll turn it over to two of you. So um, it's, a, it's an abstract line to draw clearly mm -hmm. because at organizations, there is always interchange between board and staff. And so um, one of the really key things is actually being in the boardroom and getting to interact with board members and understanding how they respond to the sorts of questions that you ask. But there's certainly some overlap here. I agree with Ben. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it, to me it felt like there were, there were two kind of tracks that this ran on and one was was being given that access and going in and seeing how the board operates and the second was was the project we did work with a couple of the um people who were on the board in our project so they did kind of bleed into one another but it did feel like to me two separate tracks of what i was trying to achieve with that organization one felt like it was very driven by me and in the board as a non-voting member i felt a lot more just kind of somewhat passive and, and lucky to be there and um on a number of occasions, really, really fascinated by what was going on. Okay, so Mark I, I would like I to weigh in. So ha having interacted now with these nonprofits through the process of their application, they're incredibly excited to have you. Like mm -hmm. they view you as a huge resource that takes them out of their day to day and can see kind of bring that, out, the, that outside wisdom and outside talent that, to bear on their problems. Um, so they're hugely excited uh, um, to have you guys come and participate. There's huge motivation on their part. And I think also in a, from a very good and true place, uh, authentic place, that it comes that they want to give back to the community. And they see Berkeley and you as part of their community. So they want to give back uh, to the community just as well. So, that's part of their motivation. Yeah. Just a follow-up question. Is there, specific, um, is there a specific line that's drawn in terms of the, it's on, what was expressed from you is that you do kind of the board work and that you sit on it and get to participate in some ways and then you do a project for them. Is there, there is a specific line between work that is board work and work that is organizational work just generally and I'm curious if that line is drawn. In, in these spaces? Um, I, I mean, I would say no, just in that there were a number of board members that just volunteered to take on projects that needed to be done for the organization in general, as long as it fell under like those buckets of like maybe more strategy focused, finance focused, um, like marketing performance, things like that, where they may not have a full-time staff member. So often we were asked to give updates about what we were working on when we were at the board meeting in the same way that like, 
the board member who was responsible for like tracking donations would report back to the board and like the board member that was responsible for like general communications to the donor list would report out what they were working on. So it was just like its own work stream, but still in the same way that other members of the board had work streams as well. And I would say that it depends on the organization yeah. because yeah. there sometimes is, um, as Juliana described, no line between board work and staff work because the board is required to roll up their sleeves and do the work that staff would do at a larger organization. And at a, a board like Habitat, which is more formal in a bigger organization, um, it's very different. So it will vary from board fellowship to board fellowship. Okay. All right. Oh, this is high. <laughs> um, for our second year students, I'm wondering if you can tell us about your expectations walking into the experience and how that differed or corresponded to your actual experience. At this point in my Haas journey, I had no expectations. I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> I was signing up for everything. I think I was in this room every day for about a week. <laughs> I didn't pay for any lunches, but I was completely overwhelmed. Um, and, and that's what I came in with. I came in with kind of an interest and not too many hard and fast expectations. To me, the, the, the two things were as, as simple as one, access to seeing something I'd never seen before and understanding how a board in America worked. I'd, I'd seen it elsewhere in the world and I wanted to see it here and, and this absolutely checked that. The second was, to, to call it out, kind of coming to Berkeley, we, we're, we're really in a privileged position and we're walking down Telegraph every day past people who are far less privileged than ourselves. and. Um, I wanted to assuage some of my existential guilt by trying to be useful in some way, and that was my other hope of this, and again, absolutely checked that box as well. Um, I didn't really give like my background bio, but I was a teacher for four years, and then after that I was on the alumni board of TFA in San Diego when I moved there, and I... I served on that board as a way to kind of like connect and understand that community when I moved there, but knew that I wasn't going to be working in the um, nonprofit sector. And so I kind of had the same idea when I moved here. Like, I've never lived in Berkeley before. I want to know what the Berkeley, Oakland area is like, what um, challenges they face in like the education sector. And so this was certainly like really informative of that. We got to visit schools, talk with people that were teaching students there, um, learn a lot about like the teacher strike and things like that. So. Um, I found it really informative in that sense. Um, and then also to see how board leadership works in the nonprofit sector. I mean, I think that it's something that I aspire to do in the future. I think to one of the questions about continuing to serve on boards, the challenge there really is like people are paying for the privilege of being on these boards in most circumstances. And it's not something I think I'll be able to afford in the near future. So it was like a great opportunity to, to do that and think about you know, in a few years, like, where do I see myself, like, wanting to put money and service hours towards? And just to put a finer point on Juliana's comment about paying to be on a board, which she's referring to, if you're unfamiliar with it, is the fact that for most nonprofit organizations, it's expected that board members make a donation. Um, and one of the ways to view this is through time, treasure, and connection. So there are definitely boards that will be happy to have you plumb your um, business school classmates. Um, to have them make donations, just FYI. Yeah. I know there were a couple of other questions. Uh, I was wondering kind of what lessons learned there were and what your exchange with other Berkeley Board Fellows is, because I feel like it seems like a constellation of great things happening, but are we all getting better through the experience? What are your thoughts on that? Um, so like lessons learned in terms of, uh, for like the larger Berkeley community, I'm. I know we kind of like have a presentation that other folks are invited to at like the culmination of the program. And so, you know, if it, if it doesn't work out that you participate this year, I would suggest going to that and learning a little bit about it. Um, personal lessons learned. I think um, you are paired with someone else. I ended up being paired with someone that's very fantastic and was like very aligned with what we both wanted to execute on. Um, I think it's really helpful to sit down and make sure that you have alignment with whoever you're working with and the organization. Um, she and I both kind of like are just the type of people where every time they were like, hey, can you also do this thing? We were like, sure. And then that became a little overwhelming. So mainly it's really about sticking to the scope and reminding them that you have like a lot of other responsibilities and things on your plate. Um, it, it is it was a personal challenge to say no to things that I knew could be useful for them, but I simply was not related to our project and didn't have the time for it. 
Yeah, I think I think that's that's great. You've taken all the stuff I was going to say. I will say it in a different way. Um, for me, it was it was accountability in that you you get this thing and you start to feel good about it. Maybe you put it on LinkedIn and like five people like it and that's great. Um, <laughs> and then other stuff starts happening as well, and you know it's easy to let it drift. And then Harsemity happens, and then Christmas happens, and then all this other stuff happens. And so for me. I would ha like highly, highly encourage people to get going early and to front load it. We ended up with a lot of work to do in the last few months when I was also trying to find a job. And so that was something that I really learned was really kind of plan your time out, map your time out, take ownership of it, take ownership of the project. Um, yeah, and hold yourself to a, to a high account. Don't just, don't just do this for a nice little line on your resume which shows that you're committed to social impact do it because you can make a difference and if you really want to make a difference like start soon and get on the front foot with it i'm sure we'll have some question about how much time we spent on this i'm i just sense yeah. that um <laughs> so uh for my partner and i we met for an hour each week and then would assign like action items to complete by the time that we met again the following week Every other week we met for an hour and a half or half an hour we'd be checking in with our like mentor at the organization. Um, and then we also attended monthly board meetings. They alternated between, they, were, they weren't quite monthly. There were some like over holiday months we didn't end up doing it. But um, they alternated between virtual meetings and meetings in San Francisco, like near the ferry building. So right off Embarcadero. Um, I will say like I, sign up for lots of things. This was not my only time commitment. My partner is Molly, who's president of MBAA. She had lots of time commitments. And um, we still put together a, um, the project that our client asked for, and they were happy with the results. So I, would, I wouldn't want to discourage anyone from thinking that this is like an insurmountable time commitment, but you do need to be really dedicated to it um, just for the nature of what the commitment is. I was going to ask you who your partner was, and that makes so much sense. Yeah. <laughs> my, my partner and I did the same thing, but then cancelled the meeting and thought we'll do more next week, and then cancelled that one. And then before we knew it, it was nearly Christmas, and did like 20 hours um, really, really intensely to kind of catch up. So do it, do it like Juliana and Molly. Two, <laughs> two very distinctive work styles on display. Right, why don't I ask, people who have questions, can I ask you to line up as weirdly formal as it is, just because the people who are sitting in the front are always going to get there first. It just won't be fair. <laughs> Um, hi, uh, I was wondering if you guys could touch on what the benefits slash challenges are between like serving in a very small local nonprofit versus, you know, in a division for you know, obviously pretty well known national um, nonprofit and yeah, just curious. Uh, to, to speak of mine, one was they, they throw great fundraisers. So <laughs> the first thing I did was turn up at a fundraiser and they thought I was there to spend money. Um, <laughs> and the auctioneer targeted me for like an hour. Um, and I managed to hold on to my wallet. I'm, I'm from Yorkshire in England, so we don't part with money very easily. Um, further to that, I think one of the challenges that we <laughs> faced was they were kind of used to volunteers coming in and we'd been asked, we were, we were brought in by the executive director and given to someone else who was new in the company. And so because of that, it felt like we didn't necessarily have the commitment that I think some people felt in smaller organizations where you were really kind of brought into a family. I would temper that with, we also had really amazing people there and the board was made up of incredible people doing incredible things in the Bay Area that were great for my one learning from and two network. So I think both have their, their relative strengths and weaknesses. And I guess we'll find out from Juliana now. Um, so ours was a smaller local nonprofit, but one of the big challenges that they were weighing is, as I mentioned, they use AmeriCorps um, members as like their educators. And they had a lot of constraints placed on it by the rules of the AmeriCorps program. And so one of the things that they were grappling with was like whether or not to break out of that and like could they actually have a pipeline outside of that program and would they be able to fund it. So um, I think in a, in a sense you don't have a lot of, uh, you don't really like have a life raft if you're a standalone smaller organization. Like if things go down and you're not able to like make ends meet, there isn't a way to shift 
any kind of financing around from other chapters or other areas in the country. Um, so, so that did present some unique challenges in terms of like their limited options. Hi. Um, my question is, I heard from Joey that it, you were in our position like thinking about a lot of things to do. So how did you end up deciding which things to do in the end and what was like the decision process for that? Because uh, we have a lot of options of stuff to do extra class and I think it's going to be useful information. Um, so uh, this is pretty much what I've told every first year I've talked to you about this and this is the way that I approached it. Think about what kind of skills you want to build, not just from a career perspective, but the things that you want to get involved with at Berkeley. For me, that meant engaging in like practical hands-on projects that I could use to talk about in interviews or networking events and things like that. So that was something that I felt like was going to get out of it. Aside from getting to like partner with this amazing nonprofit, everything I've chosen to do on campus is because it's creating like a tangible experience of like leadership or a project that I'm executing on. Not to like denigrate any of the other cool things that you can get involved in, but I wasn't looking to build skills in like hosting events or like cocktail hours or bar of the week or anything like that. It just wasn't what I felt like I needed to develop. Um, so I think I would say reflecting on that, like what, are you, what, like what are you trying to get out of the experiences you have outside of your coursework? Um, as a more meta thing, I would encourage you all to look upon second years, not as people that got it right, but people that held on long enough to survive. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I made a lot of wrong choices. This was a right one. I think I would encourage you to, for me, look at what, what motivates you. So I've always been motivated by an impact on my surroundings and my environment. That's, that's been a way I've always kind of judged my, my, my value in, in the community that I'm in. And I felt like this was a way that I could both kind of learn and give back at the same time. Uh, the other things that I was very drawn to were um, GSI roles, uh, HSA roles, um, and kind of, yeah, very kind of community focused roles. I was, I was exactly the same in that I felt like I, I ticked a few other boxes earlier on in my career, but I, that didn't stop me applying for some ridiculous things, which I'm really glad I got rejected from. So um, we didn't necessarily get it right. We just got lucky. Um, and yeah, we just we, we, we don't have all the answers. We just, we just managed to hold on all the way through first year. I'll, just, I'll add a couple of thoughts in response to that question too. I would say um, this can be a particularly powerful platform to observe people practicing mm. types of leadership. Do, uh, doing it well and doing it poorly, and especially values-based leadership and adaptive leadership. And so one of the, one of the great um, learnings in this experience is being in a place where people are really in a challenging spot sometimes practicing these different things that you learn about here and seeing it outside of an academic setting or a case mm -hmm. Um, bumping up against the real world, specifically in the nonprofit sector, and that's very valuable. Um, I'd also say, just at a more practical level, you know, sort of be real about your level of commitment. Once you say yes, we expect you to to do this. It's not like there are real people's lives who that change as a result of people flaking on this after they've agreed to serve as a board fellow for an organization. So one of the things to check is like, am I ready to actually do this? Other questions from the audience? Thought I saw somebody else. You, you had a question back there. Did it get answered? Yeah, that was, it was about the large organization versus small organization. Okay. Yeah. Um, so part of what you've been speaking about is either taking your existing skills and utilizing them or trying to develop new skills that you haven't necessarily used in your prior work. And given the fact that it's for your benefit but also for the benefit of a board, like what's the right balance to strike between going to things that you don't have very much experience in, but you're like, I want to learn, versus, oh, I can actually contribute something from my prior experience. Um, I guess trust the selection process. We obviously express interest in where we'd like to go, and I think that's, that's held, that's, that's taken account for, but there's also some very smart people placing you in, in the right place. And that might not be where you thought you'd go, but it will be somewhere that you can add value. And I really believe, like having spoken to everybody that's done board fellows is wherever you go, if you want, whatever you want to get out of it, you will. As long as you're focused, as long as you're intentional, um, as long as you, you, you give it what 
what it needs, then, then you'll get a hell of a lot out of it. And in doing so, I think the more, the more that you put in, the more that they'll get out of it as well. So I think just, it's wanky, but trust the process. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with that. I think also you have some control over the scope and it's up to you to be honest with yourself, like what you're comfortable and not comfortable with doing. Um, when we were asked like, hey, can you like go through our budget and review all of this? And it was like myself and another former teacher, we were like, this isn't in our wheelhouse. Like I'm gonna be honest, it's like this is probably something that we shouldn't do. Um, and so we focused on things where we did have some like existing skill. Um, I think when I say more like developing other skills, I had never worked on like a consulting project before. It's very different to work on something where you are not then going to implement it, but you have to trust the people that you're partnering with, that you're putting something in place and it's organized enough that they can then run with it once you leave. And so that was a different, um, just like a different muscle to exercise, I guess, in this setting. I would just say, um we are very mindful of never putting our board fellows in a position where they're uh, not um, well poised to succeed. So, you know, w regarding just the initial uh, conversations around scope, um, even the, the types of projects that we put to nonprofits that should participate, they're aligned to skills that students often have or learn here. And when issues of scope changes come up, we discuss them with the board fellows to make sure you're never expected to deliver on something that's unrealistic to expect you to deliver on. Are you gonna get the final, the final question? Okay, this hopefully will be quick. But you mentioned the mentors, and I was curious yeah. how that process works in terms of the mentor program for the board fellows. Um, sure, I, I don't know what the situation was like for you, but we, um, I think typically you're supposed to work more closely with the leader of the board, I'm not sure. We worked very closely with both the head of the organization and the leader of the board. Um, the head of the organization we checked in with more regularly, I think it's usually the leader of the board. It's just kind of like how it worked. The project that we were working on was more aligned to things that she was doing. Um, they met with us uh, after the kickoff to just sit down and go through the scope. Uh, we had our final meeting with just the two of them to like present our findings. Um, but they also tried to source other unique opportunities for us, which was really great. Um, the, our lead of our board actually um, is usually invited into the power and politics class to speak, and so she invited us to come for the session that she spoke at, um, and then also sometimes would source connections. Um, uh, the other board fellow I was working with was still actively looking for internship roles, and she was like sourcing contacts for her and things like that. So I would just say they're a really positive partner to have both for the work and then just as a business contact? Yeah, I think my mentor was someone who was also on the board and someone was, who was a little closer to our age and, and someone who'd worked there for a while and just felt kind of like a confidant, like someone you could go to with those initial questions of like, if I'm not hearing back from this person, what do I do? Someone that you could kind of be a little bit more vulnerable with than you might want to be directly with the organization. And just in, in doing so helped facilitate that initial conversations and getting over the ambiguity of it and start pushing through. I, I just found him to be a very easy, relatable person that gave me kind of the belief and the strength to then start challenging the board. And, and his insights were very, very useful in then my own understanding of the dynamic of the board as well. He was someone who was really interesting to step out of a three hour board meeting and say like, how about that? Like, Who's, who's that person? Like, what, what are they working on? And so he just really provided a lot of context and support, I think. So I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank Joe and Juliana very much for sharing their insight with us. Um, please, please do apply and reach out if you have questions in the meantime. And, you, you, you know, you often get wine related to board fellows. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wine.